months, I guess, since I've been with you. It's good to be back at the Bread of Life Church in Sailor Good to be alive this morning, amen, in God's house. The sun is to my back. I feel it on my legs, and I love it. Praise God. I'm tired of winter. I'm ready for the springtime. Times change. It's got me throwed off a little bit this morning. Anybody else is here? What is it? The internal clock messed up this morning? Praise God. A little early getting up something like this morning. Grab your Bibles if you would. I have quite a bit of reading I want to do this morning. So it will benefit you probably if you would take your Bibles and turn there in Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel. Not too far from the front of your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 19. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. Again, I'm going to do quite a bit of reading this morning. If you would just bear with me. It might be easier if you follow along in your Bible. But I just want to share with you what God has laid on my heart this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 19, we begin reading verse 15. So the king returned and came to Jordan. And Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king to conduct the king over Jordan. And Shemiah, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, was a, which was of the Hurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they went over Jordan before the king. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shemiah, the son of Gera, fell down before the king, and as he was come over Jordan, and said unto the king, Let, my, let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, Neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that the Lord thy king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant does know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first day of this of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zerah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this? because he cursed the Lord's anointed. And David said, What have I to do to you, ye sons of Zerah, that you should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? Or do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And therefore the king said to Shemai, Thou shalt not die, and the king swear unto him. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard. There you go. <laughs> nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed and to the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore winnest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me and ask that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my, unto my lord the king, but my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house will have led him before the lord the king. Yet didst thou set the ser thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I to cry any more before the king? And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matter? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take for all for as much as my lord the king is such coming peace unto his own house. And Brazilia the Gilead came down from Regalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. And now Brazilia was a very aged man, even four score <coughs> years old. And he had provided the king a substance while he lay at Maedaim. For he was a very great man. And the king said to Barzai, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Barzai said unto the king, How long am I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old, and cannot discern between good and evil. Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more of the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore, then, should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, 
And why should the king recompense at me with such a great with such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let's pray together. Father God, again, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us. But God, this morning I am most thankful for your living word. God, it just amazes me how after all these years you have preserved a perfect copy. And I hold it this morning in my hand, Father God, and I thank you for it. God, it is alive. I do thank you for it, God. I just pray that you speak to us through it this morning, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now, if we had time to back up and read a little more, a few chapters before where we've read this here, we would see where David, he has left Jerusalem. You see, his son, Prince Absalom, he decides and he's planning to overthrow his father and he's going to take over the throne. So David, he flees. David crosses over to Jordan and he leaves the promised land altogether in an attempt not only to save his own life, but he also wants to, he wants a little extra time to rally up, to muster up his troops. And also the Bible says that he didn't want his brethren, he didn't want the Jews fighting and shedding blood inside of the city, inside of the city. So he leaves and, and leaves all the way out of the promised land. Eventually Absalom, he comes after David and a battle ensues there. And long story short, maybe you remember what happened to Absalom. Does anybody remember what happened to Absalom? You remember Absalom was the son of David who had the long, flowing, beautiful hair. And the Bible says that the mule walked up under an oak tree. You remember that? And his hair got tangled up. And the mule walked off and left him hanging there. It said between the heavens and the ground, he's just hanging there. And David's men come up and they slay Absalom. So David's enemies, they've been defeated. Once again, David, he is the uncontested king of Israel. And finally, the people say, David, we want you to come back to Jerusalem. Absalom's dead. We want you to come back. We want you to reign over us. We want you to be our king again. And that's where we began reading this morning in verse 15. The king, he's come down to the Jordan River. He's about to cross back over into the promised land. He's about to come back home. The king is returning home. Can you imagine this morning the welcome that he probably got there? Can you imagine the big deal that it must have been? I imagine it was probably a big party. The Bible says that the men of Judah, we don't know how many men, but the men of Judah came down to meet him. And then David, he has a thousand men with him. I imagine they probably lined the banks of the river. I imagine his closest friends, his closest of companions, some of them are probably saying happy, tears are in their eyes. Maybe they're waving a handkerchief around, jumping up and down on the bank. A big coming home party. The Bible we read there that a ferry boat has come to meet the king and to take the King David and his family back across the Jordan River. A big, just a big deal. This big welcoming home that they must have had that day. You know, it makes me think of the homecoming that we're going to have whenever our king returns. Can you imagine the homecoming? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the king of kings returns. It can happen any second. You know, there is no Bible prophecy. There is nothing that we are waiting that the Bible says is going to happen before that moment can come, before Christ is going to return in His glory. The Bible says just as Jesus on the Mount of Olives after His resurrection ascended up, in like manner He will come back. Acts 1.11 which also said, Ye men of Galilee, Ye stand ye gazing up into the heaven. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The Bible says in Luke 21, 27, they shall see the Son of coming of man. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of glory with power and with, with power and great glory. Think about that. Friend, do you long for? Is it your prayer? Are you longing to see King Jesus return in all His glories? 
You know, this should be the greatest hope of the church. Every time, I don't know if you realize what you're saying, but every time you say the Lord's Prayer, that's what you're praying for. Thy kingdom come. We're saying, Jesus, come back. We're saying, God, please let the day be the day when King Jesus comes back. It should be our unending prayer. Always in our thoughts. Always in our mind. Jesus, will the day be the day whenever you come back and when you gather your children and take us home? You know, it's if it is our unending prayer, if that is in our every thought that Jesus would come back at any time, you know, it, shouldn't we be conscious about it? And, and, and shouldn't we be mindful and concerned about the state that we in, about who we are when He comes back? How will He find us? What, what will we be doing? What type of people will, be, will we be when He comes back, when Jesus appears? I ask you this morning, if God come, if Jesus come back today, how would He find you? How would Jesus find you? You know, in our text this morning, we read about three men. Three of the first people who met King David whenever he returned, whenever he came back into the promised land. Come on in, brother. Praise God. Glad to have you this morning. Hang on, Lord. All right, brother. Come on Sorry, in. Not a problem. We're just glad to have you. Thank you, man. We read about in the Bible three people, like I say, that met King David whenever he first came back. And that's what I want us to do the next few minutes. I want us to look at these three men. Who they were. What kind of people they were. How did King David find them? First off in verse 31, we see a dutiful companion. And Barzillai the Gilead came down from Regalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. And now Barzillai was a very aged man, even four score years old. He's 80 years old. And he had provided the king of substance while he lay at Manaim, for he was a very great man. And the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live, that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? Am I this day four score years old? Can I discern between good and evil? Can I taste or eat what and or can drink? Can I hear any more of singing of men or of women? Wherefore then should thy servant burden the king? Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, and why should the king recompense it, me with such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. We see a dutiful companion. You know, I think Brazilia is an excellent representation of our American churches. Quick to serve. Quick to give. Quick to come to the aid of others. You know, and praise God for that. Our church, the American church, does such a good job with passing the collection plate, taking up money, and assisting. We do that here through the food bank. Helping other people. You know, I imagine that the American church more so than any other religion in the world, does more to serve other people. Barzai in verse 32, we see that he has given, when the king was away, that he gives supplies to the king. It says because he was a very great man. And then in verse 31 it says, he goes down to the Jordan to help to conduct the king over to the other side. He's a man of duty. He's a man of service. He is a dutiful companion. But then when the king, he asked him, we read on there, the king asked him, he says, come to Jerusalem with me. He says, leave everything that you have behind. You've been a great servant. You've been dutiful. I want you to come with me. I want to repay you. Leave everything behind and come on with me into Jerusalem. And Barzai replies, I'll go a little way over Jordan with you. He says, but then I want to come on back. He says, I'll provide for you a trip, king. He says, if I need to provide a boat for you to get over to the other side, that's not a problem. He says, if I need to provide food, if I need to provide money, anything I need to give, it's not going to be a problem. He said, but sooner or later, I'm going to need to come back. Why is that? Why, did he, why does he have to return? We find the answer in verse 37 there. Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city, and be buried by the grave of my father and of my mother. 
He wants to return to his own city. You see that? He wants to return to his own land, surrounded by his own possessions, where his family's from, the place that he knows, all the things that he has, he's become attached to them. The king says, come with me, I'll feed you. I'll give you a life like I've, you've never seen before. I'll give you everything you need in Jerusalem. But Versailles says, he says, I can't do it. I'll go a little ways with you, but I've got to come back to my things. I've got to come back to the things that I'm attached to. Friend, do you realize that the king could have all, how much more he could have offered? What the king could have given Versailles that he could have never provided for himself. <coughs> but he was attached to his belongings. He was attached to the things that he had. Therefore, he couldn't, go, he couldn't see himself going in Jerusalem because he was attached to everything he had. He said, I've got to come back here. I need to die in my own land. I need to be buried with my father. I need to be buried with my mother. You know, it's worth noting that the king didn't have a problem with Berzai being a man of means. He didn't have a problem with Berzai having money. Matter of fact, it was his worth, it was his wealth that he used to help other people around him. But the problem was what caused him to stumble, what caused him to trip up and miss out on what the king had in store for him was when he got wrapped up, when he got too attached to his possessions. Listen to me, most all people, I'll say it, most everybody, Christians included, whenever we receive monetary things, whether it's money or gifts or cars or a house, if we are not careful to keep ourselves guarded, if we don't keep ourselves grounded, whenever God gives us something and we and we have a little bit, what do we do? We want a little more. And when we get a little more, we want a little something else. And we want a little something else. You see, it's the nature of our flesh to never be satisfied. The Bible says in 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. We want a little more. We desire to, I desire to have a little more. And when we work and we, when, when we try to have something and we earn something, and, we, and then what do we do? We want a little bit more. And we want a little more. And we can never be satisfied. And what happens is we get caught up in wanting more and wanting more. And that becomes so important to us that things and money becomes our God. And it becomes our idols. And we put those things ahead and in front of God. You think about the widow and her two mites. And Jesus sat back and the widow dropped her two little pennies, two little mites in the plate. And He commended her for what she had done. But you think about how much harder it would be for a wealthy businessman. She dropped her last two pennies into play. And God said, look at what she's done. How much harder would it be for a wealthy businessman to drop his last two million dollars into play? You think about that. The more we have, the more we get attached to it, and we've got to hold on to it, and the more important it becomes to us, just like Verzea. He couldn't go into the promised land with the king. He couldn't return into Jerusalem because he had got attached to his possession. The Bible said he was a great man. Friend, we should be no more attached to two pennies than we are two million dollars. But it's easier said than done. You think about whenever a guy come up to Jesus and he said, I've done everything that I can. I've, I've done this and I've done that. What else do I need to do? And Jesus knew he was a man of great means. And what did he say? Sell everything you got. He knew his heart. He said, sell everything you got and follow me. And the guy just couldn't see giving it all up. But it's easier said than done. I would say, hey, but why do you think it's so hard for that camel to go through the eye of that needle? It's hard. <coughs> we get attached. You know, far too often, we everybody here, everybody say, well, it's the love of money. It's not money that is the root of all evil. Well, I say this. Far too often, money most always leads to the love of money. And the love of money leads us away from God. Barzillai, just like the church, he was a man of service, but he was attached to his possessions and he could not go with the king. He couldn't turn it away. He said, I'll go a little way beyond the Jordan, but I've got to come back. I'm going to be buried in my, where my fathers and my mothers are. Let's move on. In verse 24, we see a deceived cripple. 
And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. Now, I've, I have, I've preached in here, I think, on Mephibosheth before, if you remember that. Mephibosheth is the grandson of the former king Saul. He's the son of Jonathan. And if you remember the day that Jonathan and Saul were killed in a battle, the nurse snatches Mephibosheth up to run with him, and she falls with him, and he's crippled. Well, instead of the new king, King David, keeping tradition and killing all of the family members of the former king, what's he do? Because he loves Jonathan so, so he seeks out to find anybody that survived in the house of Jonathan, the house of Saul, and he finds Mephibosheth. And he brings him in. He says that you will forever be in my palace. You will forever feast at the table of the king. And had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came in peace. While the king was gone, that he was in mourning. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore winnest thou not with me, Mephibosheth? Look at the first thing he said. He didn't say, How have you been doing while I've been gone, brother? The first thing he says is, Why didn't you go with me? Why did you not come out with me whenever I had to leave Jerusalem? Look at what he says. And he answered, O oh, my Lord, O oh, King, my servant, he's talking about Ziba, he says, My servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon to go to the king because thy servant is lame. And he has slandered thy servant unto my lord the king, but my lord the king is, is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good unto thy eyes. We see the deceived crippled. Friends, I feel strongly that when Christ returns, in the coming of our Lord Jesus, that many Christians, I'm afraid, they're going to find themselves in the same position that Mephibosheth did, a deceived crippled. What do I mean by that? See, our society is filled today more so than ever with false teachers and false preachers and false religions. Ultimately, you know, that's, hey, that's just Bible being fulfilled. That's what the Bible talks about in the end times. Jesus said in Matthew, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. There are so many out there just like Ziba, the people said servant, who are looking to deceive us, who are looking to mislead others. You know, and we, a lot of us, we easily recognize a bogus religion. We under, most of us understand that Buddha and Muhammad, we, we see the craziness in that. You know, a lot of us, even when maybe a Jehovah Witness comes up to our doorstep, we know enough of the Bible to understand and to see how they are twisting Scripture and how they mix all of that up. But sadly, if it's done in the proper setting, a lot of time, if it's done in the name of Jesus, if it's done in the right way, we too, we can be deceived. Why is that? For the very same reason that Mephibosheth is deceived. You see, Mephibosheth, over his mule, because his feet were lame, he had to rely on somebody else. He was crippled. We too are deceived because we are crippled. We are crippled because we have a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. We don't, we can't, we can't discern what's true and what's not true when a preacher or a teacher or a false prophet is telling us something that's bogus because a lot of times we have not taken the time to sit down and to personally learn and study the Word of God so that we can discern what's bogus and what's true. That's sad. You know, an example, thinking about a lot of sincere Christians they get wrapped up in these televangelists and their teachings. Now, I'm not knocking all televangelists. I don't look at them, but I know some of them's crazy. If they won't, they won't be on TV. They're just interesting, and that's why they're on there, and people want to see that stuff and hear what they got to say. So many sincere Christians get wrapped up in that and listen to that, and that becomes their prophet because they don't have the discernment of what's right and what's wrong because they fail to know what the Word of God says. Even in our church right here. Look, hey, praise God. Look, Brother Terry here, he goes to a, a Pentecostal Free Will Baptist church. I go to a Methodist church. Brother Dennis goes to a Southern Baptist church. What We are... Mixed denominational here. Praise God for that. What we're saying is we're going to lay aside little differences and we are going to base 
our truth, our church on the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing people saved for Jesus Christ. You see, denominations come about because our flesh got involved. Somebody got in, in the Bible. You see, the Bible is only meant to be interpreted one way. Not one way for this group of people and not one way for that group of people. People got involved. The flesh got involved and we have managed to mess it up. But God only intends for it to be interpreted one way. Here's what I'm saying. He goes to a church that believes a little different. And I go to one that believes a little different. And he goes to one that believes a little different. But one day, I and he and he is going to be personally held accountable about what the Bible says. He's not going to be put together and say, well, you believe like the Southern Baptist. He's going to be held accountable for what Dennis believes, regardless of where he goes to church. And the same is true for me, and the same is true for you. What am I saying? It should be worth something to you. Friend, when you got saved, you had everything you ever needed. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That's all you know to know what the truth is. Amen. Regardless of where you go to church. <laughs> But you see, we're crippled. We'll believe any little thing we're fed, just like he was deceived about the mule because his feet was crippled. We are deceived over and over and over every time you turn on the television about some crazy preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, all because we are crippled and don't know the Word of God. Friend, listen to me. It's a dangerous thing not to personally study and know the Word of God and just take somebody else's word for it. Listen to me. Brother, De uh, Brother Dennis, if he's up here, um, Brother Allen, Brother Kerry, myself, we are up here the best that we can, the best of our knowledge, trying to teach and trying to pe preach what we, what our interpretation of the Bible is. But listen to me. Don't take our word for it. Don't sit back and say, well, he said it, it must have been true. The Bible says that everything you hear and everything you see, you should be testing up alongside the Word of God. Everything that I tell you, if it don't sound right, you know what? You need to go home and you need to study the Word of God and say, is what he's telling me, is that the truth? You see, friend, hey, we're handicapped. It's a handicap not to know the Bible. And it's a far worse handicap than any two crippled feet. Praise God, let's move on. First, we've seen a dutiful companion. And second, we've seen a deceived cripple. And then third, we met a depraved cursor. Look there in verse 16. And Shemiah, the son of Gera, uh, Benjamin, I know, I know it's a lot with all of this reading and so many names, but if you bear with me, this is what God's given me this morning. And Shemiah, the son of Gera, Benjamin, which was of Gehurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shemiah the son of Gera fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. And said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that the Lord the king went out of Jerusalem. And the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come the first day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the King. Look at what he says there in 19. Again, he says, Neither do thou remember thou which thy servant did perversely the day to the Lord the King which were when you went out of Jerusalem. What did he do to the king? Verse 16, look here, he says, And, he, and when King David came to the hearing, behold, then came a man out of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemiah, and the son of Gera. And he came forth and cursed, still as he came. And he cast stones at David and all the servants of the King David. It goes on to say that he continued cursing them, and he talked ugly to them, and just how worthless he was. And he was throwing stones at them. The depraved cursing. Shemiah, he thought that now the king, he is not in, in a, in any longer in a position of power. He says he's come out of Jerusalem. He's no longer the king. He's vulnerable. So he curses at him. So he casts stones at him. He, he, he taunts the king, says ugly things about him. You know, all of us at some point or another, we've all found ourselves in Shemiah's shoes. We've all, at some point or another, some place or another, we've been enemies with God. We were born enemies of God. 
And at some <coughs> point or another, at some time or another, we have all thrown the rocks of sin. You know, Shemiah, he understands that there will, now that the king is back in a position of power, he knows that there will be repercussions of the sins that he committed against the king. He knows that the penalty for what he did is death. He knows that. Verse 21, Abishai, Abishai said, shouldn't he be killed? He cursed the Lord's anointed. Shouldn't we go and kill him right now? But what does he do? He humbles himself. He falls on his face before the king and he repents. He knows that he deserves to die. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is dead. He deserves the king's wrath. He deserves to die. But because he came before the king, he come and he begged the king's forgiveness with a repentant heart and he fell on his face, his trespasses were forgiven. Verse 23, David says, Thou shalt not die. Friend, I ask you this morning, if the trump of God does sound, maybe before this service is over, if you hear the shout of the archangel, and Jesus Christ, He returns in an instant in the blink of an eye, do you know that you've confessed that you've repented of your sin before the King of Kings? Let me put it to you this way. If Jesus were to come today, do you know you're right with God? Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you're saved? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? We said He could come at any minute. You know, maybe you say, well, I haven't cast any stones of sin. I'm not that bad a person. I do pretty good. I'm a pretty good person. What about, this, what about the stone of pride? What about the stone of unforgiveness? What about the stone of ungratefulness? What about the stone of envy? You see, sin, it don't matter how small or how great. Every sin, if it is not covered in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, every single sin, small or large, it doesn't matter. It's going to be punished. It's punishable. The Bible says by death and by hell. That's the Bible. But there's good news. Second Peter 3 9. The Bible says, The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants to give you that opportunity this morning to come to repentance. Maybe you don't recall a time in your life. Maybe you can't say it without a shadow of a doubt. If, if my life were to be taken in the next few minutes, if the King of Kings does return in an instant, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'll be with God for eternity in heaven. I don't know that I've confessed my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. This morning, as we sing the closing hymn, I want to give you that opportunity. You know, we've met, we met the King David. He met the dutiful companion. Willing to go and willing to do and willing to work in the food bank and willing to help others. As long as it was inside of his comfort zone. As long as it wasn't having to give and wasn't having to serve sacrificially. But he was connected to his possessions. And then we met the deceived cripple. Brent, are you crippled in your knowledge of the Word of God? Maybe this morning you need to make a commitment. I'm going to do better about reading and studying the Word of God so that I can discern whenever I hear truth or whether I hear just something that's made up in the name of Jesus in a church setting. And then we met the depraved cursor that humbled himself and fell before the King and said, I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. I deserve death. But the king forgave him. Praise God for that. That the king is offering forgiveness this morning. Amen. God bless you. Let's grab your head a little turn. Number 191. Stand together.